a chance to see happy birthday to her. And Debbie Malvesi has a birthday tomorrow. So happy birthday to you, Wendy. Um, Willie and Wendy have their anniversary today. So if you have a chance, text them or give them a call. Give them a happy anniversary. Uh, water bottles. We are again uh, advertising for the 830 service. Uh, I'll give you away water bottles uh, next to the events and outreaches are going to be on the 22nd, that's next Saturday. They'll be right outside here somewhere. Uh, the Vendor City is having a yard sale. So we'll be out there and next to the yard sale we will have a little tent and uh, we're giving away bottles of water with the uh, church service times on them. Uh, and then the week after, it's two, so on um, the gym, two, yes, two Saturdays after that, we will be down uh, at the Beach Jam on January, July 6th for Even Better, which is uh, the, I guess, it's a Christian group uh, put together by Jose and Bonnie, who we have a big old Bible study right down here. We're well, locked here, just to be kind of, they didn't have to know. And give these directions in the time, just like every other week. Um, today is supposed to be the last day. We are taking collections for the Jersey Shore Women's Center. Um, if you have something you wanted to bring in and forgot, please see Stephanie to let her know you intend to bring something in. All the offerings of baby bottles, we will be taking, just so you know, as an offering to the church and then writing one large check to them so that this is kind of, just, you know, inventory as part of the offering for the year. Um, today is also the last day to order a Women of the Church devotional. It's all about dollars and they're always fantastic, so I encourage you, if you're interested, to also see Stephanie about one of those. Other than that, everything can be found in your bulletin. We will begin our service singing hymn number 10.
second. It's like, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Let us pray.
rejoice with thee, for I found the coin which I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. With the words of the Nicene Creed, let us confess our faith together, saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all the world, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven. And was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. And good morning and happy Father's Day to everybody here. Today, we revisit Genesis 22, which uh, I, I didn't even realize, I think, until last night uh, when Debbie brought some Father's Day gifts. This is not the best Father's Day lesson, necessarily. Um, actually, a lot of other better Father's Day lessons in one sense. But what you're going to see, hopefully, as we work through this lesson, is there is something really neat going on here that you may not have noticed. And that's what I hope to bring out this morning. Uh, a couple months ago, I did skim through this. I didn't really go get in depth on it. I wanted to just simply to relate the whole idea. Uh, the, the lesson was Jesus talking about taking up the cross and following him and relating that to Isaac, who had to carry his wood up the hill for his sacrifice. And, but today, what we're going to look at is the theme of what God, our Father, promises us and how we can be sure of his promises. And this is this great lesson that Abraham learned. And hopefully I'll, I'll show you as we go through all these chapters, beginning in Genesis 11 to here. Abraham here has finally learned he can completely trust God's going to take care of everything. He doesn't have to worry. But you know what? It took him decades to learn this really important lesson. So this passage comes up a lot. Because I honestly think it is really one of the hardest passages just for people to sit down and read and try to work through because it's questions. And as I, I'm very fond of saying, you're allowed to ask questions, especially ask questions to God. He's the one who can answer all your questions. But you're allowed to ask questions in the scripture because that kind of opens up what it's all about. Uh, a lot of non-believers will take this particular passage and see, see, why would you want to serve a God who's like this? Who tells Abraham to go and offer his son. Uh, he can't be all he's cracked up to be. He just uh, pull it away at the last moment. So we're going to go through and walk through the passage again, uh, highlighting a number of things, reading through a number of those verses again. But I want to bring out some of these worst case scenario ideas that many unbelievers would point to and say, look at all Abraham had to go through. And hopefully we can see a great lesson that God is teaching. 
teaching us. We begin in verse 2. God says to Abraham, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Okay. I'm going to go through three important clues we should see as we go through verses 2 through 6. And before you get to Moriah and you get up that mountain, first clue is Abraham's response. Abraham receives this command and he acts on it. In fact, he acts on it with no response that we can see here. Throughout Genesis 22, we are not told anything about what Abraham feels about this command, what he thinks about this command. Uh, the only time we're told anything that Abraham feels is at the very end of the passage when he says, the Lord will provide. Now, if you ever heard the term, uh, the word, the name for God, Jehovah Jireh, that's where it comes from. It means, the Lord is my provider. That's really the only thing Abraham seems to say about what's going on. So, first clue, all we see is obedience, not questioning. All right, the second odd thing. There is a word here in Hebrew, and a lot of translations will translate it, and they'll say Isaac is his only son. Now, if you read through Genesis 11, 22, you know there's another guy in there, another son. His name is Ishmael. He is the son of Abraham and the maidservant Hagar. Um, this is important because there's a difference between Ishmael and Isaac. The word can better be translated as your unique son. Isaac. Isaac is unique for two important reasons. He's the son who was born to Abraham and Sarah, and he's the son of the promise. The son that God said, and here's the catch, God said, through Isaac, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Through Isaac, Abraham, your generations will be like the sands on the seashore. The third thing, just even the whole idea of child sacrifice. It's an abomination to God. You see that all through the Old Testament. Uh, it's something that was very common among all the cultures that surrounded Abraham. They all believed if you offer your children to whatever local deity it was, Moloch, Baal, whoever it was, then God will bless you in this world. It's kind of like the whole idea of underpinning abortion. When you think about it, there's no real difference. God always condemns murdering your children in order so you can get ahead in this world. Um, it's something that the scriptures say God does not want. He says, cut out the people who try to do this. So it should jump out. Something is really kind of odd about what's going on. Why would God say this? Why would Abraham believe it? So we got, first, his response is obedience. Second, this is the unique son of promise. And third, God is telling him to do something which God would not accept in the first place. So we got a number of balls up in the air. So these will hopefully all land in the right place as we go through trip to Moriah, uh, verses 3 to 6, it says it's three days long. And here's, again, you know, what's going on in Abraham's head is he has to walk those three days with his son Isaac and these two other men. Uh, what do you think he was feeling? How do you think he felt? Talking to Isaac because they were going along the road because he obviously didn't tell Isaac what was going on. Then you get to verse 7. Isaac says to his father, My father, behold the fire and the wood. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? 
again, if you're, if you're going to try to pick, that's going to plunge a heart, plunge a knife in Abraham's heart. But it doesn't seem to do that. Abraham says, God will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Now, yeah, I don't know what else, obviously, Abraham could have said at this point. He wouldn't say necessarily, you are the sacrificial lamb. Uh, a couple months ago, though, when we looked at the passage, that was kind of a key point for Jesus. When Jesus walked up the mountain, pulled out the place of the skull, he was the sacrificial lamb. And that, this passage was the point ahead to what is going to happen with Christ. It's really nice when you're talking about that, a picture of Christ in the Old Testament. It's not really nice when you're talking about a father talking to his son about these things. You continue down in verses 9 and 10. When they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hands and took his knife to slaughter his son. So we're really getting to the meat of it here. Let's ask some questions again, though. What's going on in Isaac's head? When does he realize that he is the sacrifice that is being offered? Does he realize that when Abraham is building the altar? Does he realize that when he's placing the wood on the altar, or does it take until he's finally being bound in his hands by Abraham? And that brings up a really important question. It's hard to find good artwork on this particular passage. It took me quite a while to find a picture I liked to put on the cover. I like to put a picture on the cover of what I'm preaching. Because it's easy to forget their ages, and most artwork will get the ages completely wrong. Even the picture on the front isn't quite that accurate. Abraham is 110 years old at this time. Isaac is mid to late teens, probably closer to 25 at this time. How can Abraham at 110 just bind up his 25-year-old son. How does that work? Without Isaac being willing, trusting his father. So that's, that's one of those things that maybe doesn't jump out at you. It really should jump out at you. That there's something extra going on here. And hopefully I can bring that out as we go along. Of course, here's where the good thing comes in. It's kind of like a Hollywood movie ending. We're waiting for it to happen, and it happens. The angel of the Lord calls to him from heaven and says, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, your unique son, from me. The picture here, God reaffirms his covenant. But it, it doesn't feel on the surface like a happy story. We're going to need some other things to bring into it to see why this is such a great story, why we like reading it all the time. Uh, our minds, if we were in Abraham's place, would felt torn apart, right? Uh, just for the opportunity to God, for God to see that Abraham was faithful, wouldn't God know that? He knows everything, right? So why is God asking him this? Why is Abraham going along with it? So let's go back to those clues I tried to bring out before. That first clue, Abraham's obedience. Why was there no pushback? What was Abraham thinking? This chapter doesn't say what Abraham is thinking, but I'm going to tell you something. There's another passage in Scripture. We're going to get to that in just a moment. that tells us exactly what Abraham was thinking and why. So just hold on to that for just a second. This, it doesn't say anything, it doesn't report anything, except for that he did exactly what God said to do. 
without withholding anything. And as I said, I think it's something those who hate God, those who are looking for an excuse not to follow God, uh, as they say, this, this is truth. This, this God is less than holy. He's no different than all those other fake gods. And there's actually really, as I said, nothing wrong with asking questions. And there's nothing wrong with asking questions to God. He has the answers. Dig into the scriptures. Do cross-references. So if we're looking at the story of Genesis 22 of Abraham, where do we look to find out why Abraham is acting this way? Well, you want to look at chapters 11 through 21, because that will all set the stage. And then we're going to look at another passage, which is Hebrews 11, in just a moment. So, four chapters earlier. Here's an interesting story. There, God says, because of the horrible sin of the people in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, God is going to destroy those cities. What does Abraham do when God says he's going to destroy two of the most wicked cities on the face of the earth, he actually pleads for these cities. He goes before God, pleading and intervening that God would have mercy. He calls out, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And God says, Well, if I can find five good people in these cities, I'll spare them. In two cities, he couldn't find five good people. Abraham questioned God's justice. In dooming these two horrible cities. But he doesn't say anything when God says to take his special son and burn him on an altar. So, as I said, a passage from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 is sometimes called the Hall of Faith. Hopefully, you've heard that term before. It's a wonderful chapter which kind of goes through the many witnesses of the Old Testament who lived not believing we're saved by our good works, but lived by faith in the promises of God. Because, and here's the bottom line, here's what Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is trying to teach those who are new. You can't trust in your abilities. Our salvation is from God alone. So this is Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise, Abraham, was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And he considered that God was even able to raise him from the dead. So there's the first book. Genesis might be silent on Abraham's thoughts, but Hebrews tells us Abraham was thinking about the situation all along, and he was acting by faith. Abraham believed the Lord would do something. And so he just trusted and followed. Why did he believe the Lord would do something? Maybe he would stop his hand. Maybe he wouldn't. If he wouldn't, he would certainly raise Isaac back from the dead. And this is the great part. And this is the part hopefully we can take home. This is where you put your stars around the sermon. Abraham had struggled with God's promises many times. Through his life. Abraham he questioned, is God really going to keep this promise? And God kept every promise to Abraham, even if that promise was impossible. Abraham got his faith precisely because of the fact that though his faith faltered, God was faithful to him through everything. Despite the fact that we can struggle in our faith, and here's the good news, we're saved by God. It's not us. 
It's God who saves. He is faithful. Even if we're not, uh, St. Paul says this. I love the translation I read this morning from the ISD. It's a newer translation that I've really been enjoying reading through lately. Uh, Paul says this, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2, 13. Our faith may fail, but his never wanes. So that's who he is. He never changes. Uh, traditionally, you may have heard it as, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, because he cannot deny himself. What happened with Abraham? during his life. Well, earlier, uh, you may know the story, it happened two different times, once in Egypt and once in Canaan, where Abraham was afraid he was going to be murdered. Why? Because he thought his wife was too pretty. And he went into a land, and the kings of that land thought his wife was pretty. So he said, oh, she's my sister. You can have her. And the kings took his wife into their bedrooms. And before anything could happen, two different times, God said, no, this is wrong. And he went to punish the kings until the kings straightened everything up and apologized to Abraham and threw him out, basically, for lying to them. He didn't trust God, despite what God had promised to him. He did not believe when God told him he was going to have a son with Sarah. This was not when he was 100. This was back when he was like 60, 50, 60, 70. And he said, God, let Eliezer of Damascus be my son. Let me adopt him, and he can be my heir. And I said, no, you're going to have a son with Sarah. A decade passes. Sarah says, here, why don't you take my handmaid? You can have a son with her. And Ishmael is born, because Abraham figured, oh, you know, God's not going to do this, so I'm going to have to take care of it myself. I says, no, that's not what I said. You can trust my promise. There is a reason, and a good reason, we can't get into all of it today, but there's a good reason that God waited until Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 before the, the child, Isaac, was conceived. And one of the reasons, obviously, is this. So you can see it was impossible. So you can see that God alone did this, because there's no way otherwise this could have happened. Though Abraham was faithless, and he didn't trust God was going to protect him, God was faithful. Though Abraham laughed and mocked the idea that a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman could have a baby, God was faithful. As it looks for us, obviously, we need to make our own application out of this. Sometimes we trust in the wrong things. That's what Abraham was trusting in. He learned by the time he got to chapter 22, I can trust in what God promises me. Uh, sometimes he trusted, he tried, actually one time pleaded with God before Isaac was born. He pleaded with God, allow Ishmael to be that son of the covenant that you had promised. And God said no. God had made the promise to Ishmael. He said, you will have a son through Sarah. He pleaded for Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the most evil cities around. Uh, God had made a promise to protect those cities. And he pled for them. But here, in chapter 22, you can see that this is the answer to all these clues. God made a promise about Isaac. And he said, through Isaac, every nation of the earth will be blessed. Through Isaac, your descendants, your seed will come. And they will be like the stars in heaven and the sand on the shore. And then he takes chapters 11 through 21, and he proves to Abraham, he is a God who keeps his word and his promises. So why would Abraham need to argue and plead before God concerning Isaac? Because God's already promised what's going to happen to Isaac. 
So by the time we get to chapter 22, he actually, he now believes God's going to keep his word. God's going to follow through on his promises so I can do whatever God says and I don't have to worry about it. Um, it's sometimes hard when we look for what's going on in this world. Uh, our bodies. Uh, I, was, I was thinking of a movie uh, last night, and I don't know how many of you have seen it. It's, it's an older movie with Goldie Hawn and Meryl Streep and Bruce Willis called Death Becomes Her. I don't know if that rings a bell. Somebody rings a bell. And it's not the best movie ever, I'll certainly say. But there's one thing in this movie that I really enjoy. Uh, Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn drink this potion. And this potion is going to give them eternal life. But with these bodies. So Meryl Streep gets shot in the belly. You can actually, it's on the poster, you can see through her belly uh, on the poster. Because it's, it's this body that's going to be eternal. They start to lose digits off their hands because it's this body that's going to be eternal. This body is in our hope. This world is in our hope. So often we hope in the wrong thing. What is our hope? Where do we place our hope? We place our hope in Christ and in the resurrection. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And he appeared in a body which was unrecognizable to uh, a number of the people who first saw Jesus, even though they had spent years with him, because it was so glorified. That's where our hope is. We don't hope in this world. When we look through the scriptures, we see where our hope is. Abraham trusted because he knew where his hope was. Why would Abraham believe the story would have a tragic ending? He learned through his many failures and his many times of not trusting God that he can trust him. That even when he has questions, God is always faithful. And of course, uh, being a pastor, I always have to bring us back to the cross. It's a wonderful picture of the gospel. Because there, Christ ascended the hill um, to be the lamb who was sacrificed for us. Uh, he was the one who, when he cried out on the cross for his father, the father's hand was not stayed. And he suffered death for us so that he could rise from the dead, so that we can rise from the dead. It's a wonderful picture here, Isaac and Abraham, of the gospel, except for it's a real story that's taken to completion. It shows us the gospel, and it shows us that God didn't ask Abraham to do anything that he was not willing to do himself, except for he took it to completion. So I encourage you today, as we look at the story of Abraham, you can see it not as uh, a horrible story, but it's a wonderful story of Abraham believing God's promises. And it's an encouragement to us to follow the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you have given us this example. You have shown us how we can live by faith in this world, trusting in you, a God who keeps promises, a God who will fulfill all the things he has said to us. Be with us, Lord, now as we continue our worship, lifting our prayers before your throne and as we come before your table, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reflective hymn is 21.
Christians of other branches of Christ's church, all who love our divine Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in sincerity, are affectionately invited to the Lord's table. Let us pray for the church and the whole world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace and unity of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our bishops, Bowling Ray, Chuck and Bill, for Pastor Mike, Pastor Rosalio, for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, especially St. Alvin's Church in Manhattan and their pastoral search. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For missionaries, all the same gospel at home and abroad, especially the Reformed Episcopal Seminary in Philadelphia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our family in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, for all public service, especially Joe Biden, our president. Grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, we pray especially for peace in Israel and in Gaza, in Ukraine and in Russia, for Chuck and his treatment, which began to speak, for John and his job search, for Rio, for George, and we thank you, Lord, that he's home, we pray that his health recovery may continue, for Tony, Dominic, Marion, Pat, for Larry and Debbie, we pray, Lord, for them that the decisions they'll be making with Larry's cancer treatment may be wise. And you will give Larry's doctors care and treat him for him. We pray for Margaret and Rosemary, Rachel and Michelle, the McQuaid and Catherine Lewis families, for Bill, Chuck Jr., Heather and family, Marisol, Caitlin, Morgan family, Steve's, family, Steve's mom, Phil, Jose, Anne, Susan, and Bonnie. Lord, in your mercy. Right. For the armed forces of our nation, all policemen and law enforcement officers, firefighters, first responders, health care workers, and all who put their lives in the line for us and our families' health and safety. Lord, in your mercy. Right. For Bill and all those who have departed this life in a certain hope of the resurrection. In thanksgiving, let us pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us examine our hearts and humbly confess our sins to Almighty God, saying, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men. We acknowledge and deeply mourn our many sins and wickedness, which we have been trying to find our students in the afternoon. By thought, word, and deed, against your divine majesty, provoking us justly the wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent, and are heartily sorry for these our many sins. There are members of the atmosphere that have been previously us, the burden of the hands of God. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, and most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins, to all those who have pardoned repentance and true faith for my victim, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Savior Christ says, and all who truly turn to you. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world, and he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Here also at St. Paul says, this is a true saying, worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 
pay a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto you, humbly begging you that we, well partakers of the Holy Communion, may be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction, and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy for our many sins to offer unto you any sacrifice, yet we beg you to accept this our duty and service, not weighing our merits but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be unto you, O Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and heavenly God, we most heartily thank you that you promised to feed us, who have fully received you this holy Christmas, with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you assure us thereby of your favor and goodness towards us. And we are very members of the perfect and mystical body of your Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of your other eyes and feet, by the merits of the most precious death and passion of your dear Son. And we most humbly beg you, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with your grace, we may continue in that holy fellowship. Do all such good works as you have prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn, number 581. Son and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you always.